Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless it may sound like the stuff out of movies but an asteroid hurtling towards the earth is something real life scientists are preparing for at nasa they're refining the plan because in a few short years a space rock could come quite close in about five and a half years a massive asteroid named apophis after the egyptian god of chaos will pass so close to the earth we'll be able to see it in the sky. And that has NASA scientists on high alert. We want to be able to get a spacecraft out there uh, weeks to months uh, to uh, get a look at uh, Apophis uh, before that, uh, that close encounter uh, with the Earth. Scientists working with global partners carried out asteroid threat exercises back in April to figure out if a potential planet killer is headed our way and how the world would cooperate to safeguard Earth. Yeah, we're going to need more than Bruce Willis. We're going to need actual real scientists. And, and frankly, uh, with every year and every experiment, especially the double asteroid redirect test, which was so successful, I really believe that astronauts or, or the space scientists are figuring this stuff out. Press it! Unlike in the movies, NASA has been working on tools and technology to tackle such a threat and coordinate an international disaster response. Two years ago, the double asteroid redirection test, known as the DART spacecraft, smashed into an asteroid to knock a massive space rock off its gravitational course. And it worked. All right. That's a pretty big deal for all of us on Earth. NASA hopes to use the same tested technique so we don't go the way of the dinosaurs, wiped out by a massive meteor millions of years ago. Apophis is the closest thing we know about to an asteroid that could really give us a bad day. This thing would wipe out a city no problem. But fortunately, just luck, it's not going to hit us. It's just going to come close. NEO surveyor mission. NASA says Earth. it's developing a new telescope to help find and identify asteroids as part of its planetary defense mission on track for 2027. So we'll know what's coming. The seven-year tribulation is fast approaching this world and the news headlines prove it. God in his grace and mercy is trying to shake the world out of its complacency. We are currently living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. Jesus is likening last day's events to a woman in labor. The closer we get to Jesus' second coming, last day's signs and calamities will become more frequent and more intense. Following the rapture of all true Christians to heaven, the Bible warns us that the wrath of God will be poured out on an unrepentant world. One of the judgments described in the book of Revelation includes a massive asteroid impact as we read in Revelation 8, 10, and 11. Then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. The Bible tells us a large asteroid will strike the earth in the near future. And no early warning detection or system to deviate the trajectory of this asteroid will do any good. Putting your trust in these systems will not save you from the wrath of God. Only putting your trust in Jesus Christ can save you, and he is the only way. Acts 4.12 Nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The historical significance of the Ten Commandments, of course, can't be understated. They've been the guiding principles of Western civilization for thousands of years and heavily influenced the Founding Fathers and the very documents that established our country. Which is why it makes sense that Louisiana governor just signed a new law requiring schools to display them in every classroom starting January 1st. If you want to respect the rule of law, you got to start from the original lawgiver, which was Moses. Cue the liberal freakout. This was clearly and is clearly part of an extreme right-wing uh, Christian nationalist agenda. The real focus should be emphasizing and teaching kids how to read and write, not indoctrinating them in, with, with, with uh, these, these, this type of moral agenda. 
I want to play you this clip from The View because the ladies from The View are very upset that how dare we put, put the Ten Commandments in school and they, they're actually saying it's dangerous. They want to post this in schools. Yes. I say post it at Mar-a-Lago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and put a picture of Stormy Daniels right next to it. If you want your child to have a, 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 a religious education, send them to a religious school. Yeah. That, there, that there's nothing stopping you. Get out of my pocket, get out of my body, and get out of my school. Recently, there has been a tremendous increase in mockers and scoffers that are attacking Christianity and the Bible in general. On two occasions, the Bible warns that the closer the coming of the Lord Jesus, the greater the mockers and scoffers will become. 2 Peter 3, 3 and 4 Knowing this first, the scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Jude 1, 17 and 18 But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. What is so significant in both 2 Peter 3 and Jude is, the prophets and apostles warned about mockers and scoffers. Apparently, the mockers and scoffers are a sure indicator we are living in the last days. So, John, if you had the misfortune of being a guest on The View, how would you respond to the ladies? <laughs> yeah, it's not her pocket and it's not her school. And this isn't about Trump either. They make everything about Trump. Yes. This is the state of Louisiana. Uh, uh, the governor and the legislature there decided to do this. Let's just push pot and transgenderism. That's worked well. Joining me now, Louisiana State Rep Dodie Horton, who authored the bill. Dodie, I mean, you're getting slammed. You knew you would. Christian nationalism, extreme right wing. Um, what do you hope to uh, achieve by having the Ten Commandments requirement in classrooms? Our students will be able to look up and see that the, there is a moral standard that God set forth for man to live by, one that is uh, grounded in the Constitution and the foundation of this country. Do you believe that um, this will withstand legal scrutiny? Obviously, the, the Supreme Court has gone round and round on the Establishment Clause of the Constitution and free exercise. Uh, but the liberals are already, you know, obviously weighing in legally on this. I do believe it will. With uh, the wonderful ruling with the Kennedy case and overturning of the Lemon Law, uh, which was a huge victory for religious freedom, we now have states like ours have the ability to file and pass legislation like this. And really all we're trying to do is to restore uh, traditional and historical uh, uh, standards in our schools, one that was there for you know, nearly three decades. What's amazing here is that they believe in all sorts of religious expression, whether it's DEI or wokeism or transgenderism. Yeah. I mean, they believe that that is sacrosanct and that can't be that can't be touched. You can't intrude upon that. So they have their own orthodoxy. They don't call it that, but it is. And yet something is, you know, time tested and that's the threat to reading, the fundamentals of reading, they say? It, it, it's uh, mind-boggling to me, but as you know, Laura, because you're so wonderful, every time, anytime you stand up to the national agenda, you face this type of criticism, but there's no denying that the Ten Commandments is the plumb line for which all the laws in our country were based upon. They hate the country, so, so they're going to hate the Ten Commandments. Anything that, anything that touches so, on the founding of the country or founding principles, they think is awful, rotten, racist, and unfair. So uh, the Ten Commandments, I mean, put that at the top of the list. Almost everything in this world has been perverted. The truth is being turned into lies and lies into the truth. Nothing seems to make sense anymore, at least to a righteous person, those that believe in Jesus Christ. The unsaved hold the view there is no right or wrong. Therefore, whatever feels or seems right at the time and in that situation is right. Christians hold the view that there are indeed absolute realities and standards that define what is true and what is not. To the unsaved, tolerance has become the one cardinal virtue of the postmodern society, the one absolute, and therefore intolerance is the only evil. Any dogmatic belief, especially a belief in absolute truth, is viewed as intolerance, the ultimate sin to an unbeliever. If there is absolute truth, then there are absolute standards of right and wrong, 
and we are accountable to those standards. This accountability is what people are really rejecting when they reject absolute truth. The denial of absolute truth and the cultural relativism that comes with it are the logical result of a society that has embraced the theory of evolution as the explanation for life. If evolution is true, then life has no meaning, we have no purpose, and there cannot be any absolute right or wrong. Man is then free to live as he pleases and is accountable to no one for his actions. Yet, no matter how much sinful men deny the existence of God and absolute truth, they still will someday stand before God in judgment. The Bible declares this in Romans 1, 19-22, Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Is there any evidence for the existence of absolute truth? Yes, there is the human conscience, that certain something within us that tells us the world should be a certain way, that some things are right and some things are wrong. Our conscience convinces us there is something wrong with suffering, pain, and evil, and it makes us aware that love, generosity, compassion, and peace are positive things for which we should strive. The Bible describes the role of the human conscience as we read in Romans 2, 14 through 16. For when Gentiles, who do not have the law, by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. God has revealed his truth to us through his word, the Bible. Knowing absolute truth is only possible through a personal relationship with the one who claims to be the truth, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life, and the only path to God. The fact that absolute truth does exist points us to the truth that there is a sovereign God who created the heavens and the earth and who has revealed himself to mankind in order that we might know him personally through his son, Jesus Christ. That is the absolute truth. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Adoption brought me the greatest joys that I have in life. My three children, their blessings even in their teen years. Yeah, it's not easy. But millions of adoptive parents and foster parents here and around the world feel the same. It's a beautiful thing. But the same activists who claim to care so much about the children are actually hurting the children by blocking devout Christians from becoming foster parents. Pastor Brian Gant and his wife Rebecca have been fostering kids since 2016, and they say that last year the Vermont Department of Children and Families asked them to take in a baby about to be born to a homeless woman addicted to drugs. Well, after praying about it, they decided to say yes. But then they got an email from the state explaining that they must accept the state's orthodoxy about gender fluidity, even if the foster parents hold divergent personal opinions or beliefs. Well, they can't say that they would unconditionally love and support any child a place with them, but of course they would not forsake their own religious beliefs. Joining me now is Pastor Brian Gant and his attorney, Mallory Slight, 
Uh, Pastor, now you say that the Department of Families and Children responded by refusing to just let you take this child, and then they revoked your license? <laughs> what is going yes. on here? Yes, they did. Um, it's been amazing. We've uh, fostered for over seven years. We adopted three kids out of the foster care system. And now because simply of our religious beliefs, we can't even take a baby to foster according to the state. I, I can't believe this is the United States of America. I, I say that a lot lately, but this, it's Chris Winters, who is the commissioner of the Department of Children and Families, said that we want to make sure that kids in foster care are placed in homes that support all aspects of what makes them who they are. And that sometimes include their sexual orientation or their gender identity. Mallory, uh, you know, again, your client was going to take in a baby. So uh, how does gender ideology play into this? And isn't this just rank religious discrimination by the state of Vermont? It absolutely is. And really, gender ideology doesn't play into this. In fact, the department chose the Gants out of all of their foster parents because they're so great with kids who are dependent on opioids. And yet, because of their religious beliefs, the department then changes their minds and says, not only can you not foster this child, you can't foster any infant baby, even for a couple hours for respite care because of your religious beliefs. Uh, uh, Brian, Brian I, I've got to say, um, I've looked into this case, and you have an exemplary record, unless I'm missing something, of what you've done for kids who are unwanted in the state of Vermont. And you and, and your wife are, like, incredible. And you've gotten praise. The licensing caseworker um, uh, has said that, I hope we continue to find more families like yours. And the resource coordinator said, the whole department agrees that you're the perfect home and first choice for this baby. Again, Pastor, I mean, your religious beliefs, your belief in God and the Bible means that, you, that all those words, I guess they don't matter anymore. Apparently not. You know, again, we had had such a wonderful relationship with the department for seven years. Um, you know, it's just our heart as Christians to care for these kids that are in need. I pastor downtown and I see the needs of family. I see the drug crisis every day from my office as I look outside. And we just want to mm. be part of this solution. So, Mallory, not only do they want to fuel um, more homelessness and drug addiction by pushing legalization everywhere, but now they want to take away foster homes. Uh, from unwanted babies because they hate Christians. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm being very blunt tonight, but that seems what is going on. They, they get you both ways. Only a couple days ago, the department sent out another email to everybody on their list begging for any ideas they had or solutions because they're out of options. And it's such a placement crisis, and they have so many children that they can't place that they're begging for help. And yet, we represent two families right yeah. here who have adopted five kids, and they're told you, you cannot adopt or yeah. foster because of your religious beliefs. Christians need not apply. Brian and Mallory will be following this. Remember to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Hebrews 13.3, 1 Corinthians 12.26. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Matthew 5.10-12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecute the prophets who were before you. 1 Corinthians 16.13 Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Furious reaction from Moscow to the latest attack by Ukraine on Russian-held Crimea. American-made attackers' weapons fired by Ukrainian forces were intercepted by Russian defences. But the debris killed civilians on a beach, including children. Russia summoned the U.S. ambassador and is vowing to retaliate. Thousands of attacks have been carried out in more than two years of war between Ukraine and Russia. The consequences have been devastating for civilians all round. Both sides have been using the most advanced weaponry available in the war. So how has military technology evolved during the conflict? What's the risk of outright war between Russia and the West? A moment to grieve in Sevastopol. 
with flowers laid at a makeshift memorial for victims of a Ukrainian missile attack. This was the moment on Sunday when a trip to the beach for holidaymakers turned into a terrifying ordeal. Debris from high-precision guided missiles raining down on the sand in Crimea, scattering those who had come for fun and relaxation. And not all reached safety. Several people, including children, were killed and many others were wounded. The tutor from our kindergarten has suffered. We were on the beach when all of this happened. It is an unbearable pain. Moscow summoned the U.S. ambassador over what it called a barbaric attack, saying it provided Ukraine the technology, guidance and training. The U.S. says it's no secret it provides the weapons, but it's up to Ukraine how it uses them. We provide weapons to Ukraine so it can defend its sovereign territory against armed aggression. Uh, that includes in Crimea, which of course is part of Ukraine. And Russia could stop this war today. The U.S. began supplying Ukraine with short-range attack and missiles last year. Two months ago, it started to supply longer-range versions, which can hit targets up to 300 kilometers. Since the very start of this war, the United States and a number of allies, uh, countries have been saying uh, that they will continue to supply military intelligence, photo reconnaissance, satellite uh, imagery uh, to the Ukrainian armed forces. Russia is also relying more heavily on advanced weapons. Ukraine says Moscow has been using hypersonic missiles in major cities, including the capital, Kiev. This includes the Zircon hypersonic missile, which experts say travels at nine times the speed of sound and is nearly impossible to shoot down. President Vladimir Putin has disclosed Russian forces have used these and other hypersonic missiles against military infrastructure. Russia has declared it will retaliate against the Sevastopol beach attack, with the West handing Ukraine more advanced weapons and Moscow also admitting to using them. Many are concerned the war that's gone on for more than two years may now be entering a new and more dangerous phase. More than 100 victims of the October 7th attack are suing the United Nations Relief and Works Agency. They claim UNRWA knew its facilities and funds were being used to help Hamas in Gaza. The suit comes as the families of three hostages are releasing new footage of what happened to their loved ones on that horrific day. More than 100 victims of the October 7th Hamas attack are suing UNRWA. They accuse the U.N. aid agency for Palestinians of aiding and abetting the terror group's assault and are seeking $1 billion in damages. We suddenly became aware that that UNRWA had a, a huge, huge role in, in, um, in, in what happened. Uh, but what we uncovered that was surprising is the scheme for funding uh, Hamas's acquisition of smuggled weapons, explosives, and, and other things. Attorney Gavi Marone filed the complaint in a New York court, saying UNRWA's own reports indicate they knew that Hamas stored explosives, assault rifles, rockets, and mortars in their schools. Obviously, the end of the story is that they absolutely provided safe harbor for Hamas terrorists to use those schools the safe harbor protecting the Israeli army trying to, you know, discover them. The suit comes as hostage families approved the release of new footage showing their loved ones being taken captive from the Nova Music Festival. We and the other families felt that it's very important any piece of evidence of what happened on October 7th, how these people were stolen from their lives, is critical for the world to see. American Israeli Hirsch Goldberg Polin. Elia Cohen and Orr Levy were hiding with others in a bomb shelter. Many were killed when terrorists threw grenades into the shelter. Hirsch's forearm was blown off. Israel's prime minister says he's open to a ceasefire to return the hostages, but is committed to eliminating Hamas as a fighting force. In Rafah, in Gaza, the IDF is nearing its goal. <laughs> We are clearly approaching the point where we can say that we have dismantled the Rafah Brigade, that it is defeated not in the sense that there are no more terrorists, but in the sense that it can no longer function as a fighting unit. After that, Israeli leaders agree they'll turn their attention to the northern border with Lebanon, where Israel is already fighting Hezbollah.
we will have the option to transfer part of the forces to the north, and we will do that, first and foremost for defense purposes, secondly to return our residents home. Meanwhile, in a move that could threaten the stability of the Netanyahu government, Israel's Supreme Court today ruled that the military must begin drafting ultra-Orthodox men who have been exempt by law due to their religious beliefs. Luke 21:25, And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days right before the return of Jesus Christ is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. Defiance on the streets of Nairobi met with water cannons and tear gas. All across Kenya, protesters are demanding their government back down on a controversial bill which is expected to raise $2.7 billion in additional taxes. They say the finance bill will choke the economy and raise the cost of living at a time when Kenyans already struggle to make ends meet. Smoke billowing from its structure, a breach of Kenya's parliament. A street protests in Nairobi turned fatal, according to local media. In the Kenyan capital, thousands of protesters flooded the streets, calling for the president to step down and to voice their anger at a police crackdown against their largely peaceful protests. The movement, pegged online as Occupy Parliament, is largely composed of young Kenyans, who initially came out to voice their anger over a June 13th budget bill and was slated to raise $2.7 billion through taxes. Faced with pushback and protests, some of those taxes have been walked back. But now the demonstrators want the bill to be scrapped in its entirety. We are not hard. It's like we just elected leaders and they don't serve us. Yeah, we want to know what they used our money for. The crackdown by police against protesters has also ignited further anger. According to rights groups, live bullets have been used as well as rubber ones. There have been mass arrests and also claims of abductions. There is no criminality in assembling in the streets. I was there in the morning. I have seen the unprofessional police force. They are here brutalizing innocent citizens who are unarmed, who are only speaking. Then why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? Why? Incensed by the police crackdown and the tax bill, many say President Ruto has betrayed them, as he ran two years ago on a platform to help Kenya's working poor. Caught off guard, the president addressed the protesters, saying he's proud of their peaceful demonstrations and he hears their concerns. Yet the government is also saddled with a mountain of debt, high interest payments on foreign loans and inflation, putting Kenya, an economic powerhouse in the region, in a tight and now explosive spot. They have been waiting for news of their relatives for two days and have come to this court in Buenos Aires to find out where they are. Leonardo Campos' husband, Ramon, his daughter and granddaughter were detained last Wednesday during violence that happened while Congress debated President Javier Milei's economic reform bill, a landmark document with more than 200 proposed laws. The family says they were selling empanadas, a typical local food on the street. The three of them were taken by police. We tried to pick up our things when the chaos started. My husband and my daughter started walking with their hands in the air so they wouldn't get shot. The police threw him on the ground. My daughter and granddaughter tried to help him, but they were all detained. At least 34 people were detained during the protests and the confrontation that followed. And while some of them were involved in violent acts, many others were not. Those arrested face accusations of insurrection and terrorism. The government says Wednesday's protests are part of a plan to get Javier Milei out of office. What happened is a coup. As far as it's understood in the 21st century, they want to weaken the government so it loses strength. The Senate has now narrowly approved the bill. Since taking office, Milei has imposed a new security protocol on the streets. People are not allowed to block the roads. This has increased tension with political organizations who want to protest against the government. Javier Millet is implementing a harsh austerity plan that has left-wing groups and other movements on the streets. The government has already shown zero tolerance with these groups, and that's why human rights organizations are extremely concerned about how this government handles dissent. Nelly Minierski has been fighting for human rights all her life. 
She's a lawyer who challenged the military during the dictatorship in the 1970s and 80s. To compare a protest with a coup, to have a prosecutor investigating it, and to have so many innocent people arrested shows us that our democracy is at risk. Leonor's family and 14 others were released on Saturday because of lack of evidence. Those involved in violent acts remain in prison. But their arrest shows some of the challenges Javier Milei faces as he pushes for radical economic reform. Explosions and fire returned to the New Caledonian capital, Noumea. Pro-independence protesters have been on the street since last month, but have again intensified their action after seeing some of their leaders arrested and sent to France. It was a possibility that was signalled by the French government some time ago, but when it finally came, it caught everyone by surprise. Protests began last month over a proposal to allow more French nationals to vote in elections. A change Canucks say will marginalise their voice. President Macron has now suspended but not withdrawn the constitutional change. In Paris, supporters of the pro-independence movement gathered near the Ministry of Justice to protest against the decision to send the arrested leaders to France. A large security presence remains in New Caledonia but is unlikely to deter the protesters. And with the parliamentary election beginning in less than a week, stability in this French Pacific Territory looks a long way off. Government uprisings are now a daily occurrence in our world. People in just about every nation are protesting, rioting, and demanding their governments do a better job taking care of the people. A man, I believe, who is alive and well today, will soon come on the world scene, seeming to have all the answers, and he will bring a false peace to the nations of the world. Three and a half years after this man comes on the world scene, his true intentions will become known. He will bring war the likes of this planet has never seen. And with war will come famine, pestilence, and death. The Bible refers to him as the Antichrist, and he will be welcomed by millions of those on earth not taken with the rapture. Unfortunately, his true identity will be known soon to those left behind that his true intentions are death, destruction, and control. What do we know about the Antichrist? The Antichrist has many names. The King of Fierce Countenance, the Prince who is to come, the Beast, the Son of Perdition, the Worthless Shepherd, the Man of Sin, the Lawless One. The first sealed judgment in the book of Revelation is the releasing of the Antichrist upon the earth. Revelation 6, 1 and 2. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. The Antichrist will be evil, yet appear as a savior. He will be outspoken and have great speaking ability. He will have a fierce countenance. The Antichrist will be extremely proud. He will not desire women. He will be a military genius. The Antichrist will be mortally wounded. He will be indwelt by Satan. He will come from a revived Roman Empire. The Antichrist will control a one world government. He will control a one world religion. He will control a one world monetary system known as the Mark of the Beast. It is evident that planet Earth is in the time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. The world is seeing death destruction and despair at unprecedented levels. The events the world is suffering through right now, awful as they are, will only get worse. The Bible tells us in the last days, right before Jesus returns, there will be a time of severe distress this world has never seen or ever will see again, as we read in Matthew 24:21. For then there will be great tribulation, just as it has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. This time of distress Jesus is referring to is called the seven year tribulation in which the inhabitants of planet Earth, who have rejected God and remain unrepentant in their sin, will face his wrath. These terrible judgments are pictured as seven seals opened, seven trumpets blown, and seven bowls poured out. The first four of the seven seals are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The book of Revelation tells us when Jesus breaks the first seal and the white horse rides, the Antichrist will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the second seal and the red horse rides, war will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the third seal, and the black horse rides, famine will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the fourth seal and the pale horse rides, death and Hades will be unleashed. The Bible tells us 25% of the population of the earth will be killed at this time, as we read in Revelation 6, 8. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed with him, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, 
and by the beasts of the earth. The population of the world is roughly 8 billion, meaning 2 billion people will die during this time. The remaining 17 judgments of God include devastating earthquakes, cosmic disturbances, scorching heat, meteors, 100 pound hailstones, volcanic eruptions, loathsome sores on those who take the mark of the beast, the seas, rivers, and springs of water turn to blood, demons torturing mankind, and a 200 million strong demonic army who will kill another third of mankind, bringing the total to 4 billion. Luke 21, 26 through 28. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with Him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work, you may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready! Get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.